Apex. And we are going to be presenting our device, which is a wearable pollution detection device. I'm Joshua Freeman. I'm the project manager. Grant Laughlin, lead software engineer. Brian Terry, lead hardware engineer. Michael Diaz, installation engineer. Today we'll be covering introductions of our project, the project background, problem statement, concept of operation, conceptual block diagram, functional requirements, functional block diagram, performance specifications, responsibilities and schedule, broader impact, and conclusion. So our stakeholders of this project are Dr. Garth Crosby, he's our sponsor as well as our technical advisor, um, as well as Jeremy Johnson, he's our co-technical advisor and he's from the Texas a and Transportation Institute. So a little bit of background, um, air quality is becoming an increasing uh, problem in today's world. Um, and being able to monitor that problem, uh, we see that as very valuable. You can look at this map, it um, shows PM levels throughout Texas. PM is particulate matter, and we're just going to be focusing on PM 2.5, which specifically is uh, measuring particulate matter. That is uh, 2.5 micrometers in diameter or less. So this, these are things like smoke that you breathe in, and it can be harmful to your lungs and your uh, to you. Uh, there are many devices right now that measure this. Um, and we want to make a device that can also do it. Uh, this is a chart that uh, we're going to use that has all the different types of pollution that you can monitor. Uh, we want to focus on this red block right here, and it shows the levels that uh, you want and levels that are not good. Uh, we want to also note that if uh, it becomes possible, we want to add another sensor to um, increase the effectiveness of our device later on. Um, some more background and market competitors. On the right here, you can see the Timtop Area 1000. It's roughly $250. Uh, some pros of this, um, really all it does is collect data. Um, it doesn't save it or store it, and you can't really put it. Uh, there's no software that comes with it that you can put on a laptop and see the data and stuff like that. All it does is just read the data and outputs it. Um, and on the right is the Aeroset 831. It's roughly $1,800. Um, a pro to this one is it does have a software. However, this software is a little bit confusing, not very easy to use. Um, it does have a good, it's a good sensor though, but um, in order to transfer this data onto a computer, you have to do it through a wired connection, which can be um, not very convenient. And it's also very expensive, so if you wanted to get, say, 50 units, that's extremely expensive and not very practical. Um, so what we want to do is we want to do what those two devices we just showed you do, but at an extremely less, at a lot lower cost um, while keeping the same quality, if not better quality. We also want to wirelessly transmit the data um, in real time. So if you're taking a pollution data, we want to send it automatically to a server. And then in that server, we want to have a user-friendly application that can create a map that shows the different pollution levels as well as the location that those readings were taken. Um, and, uh, and this, we want to eventually uh, distribute these devices to middle school students in order for them to increase their interest in STEM field as well as raise awareness about pollution in Texas. So since we're going to be using our device for an educational application, um, we want our concept of operation to reflect that. So we want our device mainly to be very, very easy to use and understand for the students. So all we want them to do is be able to initialize data collection via a button press or something else that's very, very easy to do. And then the device should do everything else. So once data is uh, initialized, data collection, um, it's then going to be collected via our PM 2.5 sensor and our uh, GPS sensor, and it's going to be sent to our, our server via cellular transmission. And then uh, once our data receives the server, or once our server receives the data, it's going to be manipulated using the Google API to create a pollution heat map of Texas. <coughs> Um, so here's our conceptual block diagram. So pollutants are created uh, by factories, cars, many, many things create uh, PM 2.5 pollution. Our device is going to look something like this, collect the data, it's then going to transmit it using a cellular connection to a cell tower. That cell tower is then going to transfer that data to our server. The server is then going to uh, obtain and manipulate that data into a heat map of Texas. For our functional requirements for software, we need our device to be able to collect and store data, and it needs to store in two distinct locations. So one, it needs to store uh, locally on the device using a memory card, 
because we will not always be in range of a cell tower and it might not always be able to upload that data initially. So we want to be able to store it there. That way once we get back in range of a cell tower, it can then transfer that data. And we also want it to store uh, at our server side. Um, that way, obviously, we'll, we might need thousands and thousands of data points to create our heat map. Uh, we also want the data to be manipulated in our software as well as on the device. So on the device, we'll need to manipulate um, the PM data and the GPS data into the packets that we want to send over to the uh, server. And then on the server side, we want to create graphs, charts, uh, and ultimately our uh, heat map of Texas. We also want the software to be very user-friendly and have a very user-friendly GUI. That way, whenever students are trying to access their data, they'll be able to just use a couple of clicks to find their device that they were actually collecting data and be able to tell, uh, find all the information that they need. Finally, we want it to be crowdsourcing compatible. So whenever we have multiple classrooms of students, uh, might have 70 plus devices all trying to send data at the same time. We want all that data to be collected by our server. Uh, we don't want our server to be overloaded, and we want it to all be able to be um, uploaded to our map. We're going to be using Python for all of the coding on our server side. We're going to be using uh, C to do all this coding on our microcontroller and any onboard devices. And then we're going to be using, uh, again, the Google API in order to populate our heat map. Moving on to our hardware functional requirements. Most of these are born out of the facts that the end user of this product is intended to be a middle school student. So we're trying to get low cost for the fact that school districts need to be able to afford this so that it's accessible to the students and they can provide their students with this educational tool to implement into their curriculums to again get students to be a little more interested in the STEM field and data collection. So part of the students data collection is the portability of this device. We don't want them to be tethered to the classroom. We want them to be able to go out and see how the PM varies if they're next to a road, if they're at their house, if they're near the school, how that affects the PM reading. And going along with the portability, we need battery power because we don't want the students to be tethered to a power supply. And we also need wireless communication so that data is automatically sent to the server when cellular connection is available. And if it's not, it'll be stored on an SD card. And we also want a user-friendly device because we don't want kids to look at this and be intimidated and inadvertently get scared away from the STEM field. We definitely want them to see something that they can be interested in and excited about so that they'll be more interested in pursuing STEM. Moving into our functional block diagram, we have this split in our two main subsystems. We have our hardware on the left with our fixed physical device and our software to the right. Starting with the hardware side, up on the top left we have our power supply, which is initially set to 6 volts. This, the logic behind that is to be 4 AA batteries, again for the user friendliness because we want this to be something that is easy for the end user to change the batteries and they don't have to keep up with a charger or anything. And that 6 volts will get regulated into a 5 volt power rail and a 3.3 volt power rail for powering our various sensors and microcontrollers. The 5 volts powers our PM2.5 sensor, as well as our microcontroller and our cellular transmitter, while the 3.3 volt power rail powers our GPS chip, our data storage, and our LCD screen. So on a trigger, likely a button press, we're going to take the data from our PM2.5 sensor and our GPS chip and send that to our microcontroller, which is then going to synthesize the data into the format that we would like. Then it's going to send that formatted data into our data storage for local data storage, our LCD screen for real-time analysis, and our cellular transmitter to be transmitted to the cell tower and later to the server, which will then store that data and manipulate it to eventually create the heat map of Texas that we designed. Our performance specifications include some of the preliminary hardware components that we would like to use. For our microcontroller, we're going to start with the Arduino Uno for its ability to easily implement these sensors and so we can get our initial sensor readings over to our software team since a lot of the software is going to take the bulk of the time because of the using the Google API. So we want to get our initial sensor readings over there as soon as possible. We're going to use the 6 volt power supply preliminarily again, but also for that ease of use. So our PM2.5 sensor is the DEVMO PMS5003. That's shown in the top left of the picture cluster over there. The NEO 6M is our GPS module that we're going to use to collect our coordinates. That's shown on the top right. The hologram dash on the bottom left, as well as the hologram SIM card on the bottom right, 
will be used in tandem to provide the cellular connectivity that we need to send that data when we actually have the cellular connection. And again, we want to use the Google API to do most of the data manipulation and eventually that heat map generation. Moving into the responsibilities and schedule portion of our presentation, we are currently in the PDR as shown by the green hash right there. Initial sensor readings and software or, and electronics alpha are in progress. Those are shown as yellow. Software alpha is due to begin soon, and that will be due just prior to the end of this semester. Electronics beta and cellular connection are due at the end of this semester. Our first main deliverable for next semester will be our CDR presentation around about October 8th. Our software beta will follow shortly after that. And finally, at the end of our project, our electronics release, our integrated crowdsourcing, our software release, and our completed prototype on our demo date. Here we have our assignment matrix, which we split into the four main subsystems of our project, hardware, software, systems integration, and project management. Here we have the colored bar at the top, which will be color coded throughout the rest of the subsystems as well as the rest of the schedule. Here this shows myself at the far right as the primary on the hardware section, along with Josh as the secondary. And we've gone and delegated secondaries for each of the tasks under each subsystem. That format will follow throughout the rest of the assignment matrix. Moving on to software, we have Brent as the primary with Michael Diaz as the secondary. Systems integration, Michael as the primary with Grant as our secondary. And finally, project management with Josh as the primary and myself as the secondary. The next thing to go over is our work breakdown structure overview. Again, as Ryan mentioned, we have this color coded, and so it corresponded to our previous slides, and it'll correspond with our future slides. Uh, the subsystems of our WBS are hardware, software, systems integration, and management. The first subsystem we'll talk about is our hardware, which is broken down into product design. Uh, this itself has two subsystems, one for housing and one for electronics. Our housing subsystem is broken into two again, the first of which is our 3D printed prototype. Uh, initially, we want to have, we want to start creating 3D printed prototypes to fit all of our electronics in, and kind of test and see what works best, what's most durable, because again, it's one of those floors, it's going to get dropped, we want to make sure it's a good design for them, good to hold, and then eventually we're going to move on to our final CAD design, where we take everything we've learned from our 3D printed prototype and build our final design itself. The next subsystem we go over is electronics, which is broken into three subsystems. The first of which is our alpha, which will consist of mostly just a mess of wires in, in our Arduino with sensors. We want to make sure that we can gather the data and eventually, and in this portion we're also going to be transferring the data to our software via a USB so that our software team can get started on the work they need to do. The next portion of our electronics is the beta phase. This will consist of us actually making our PCB board. Uh, Arduinos are wonderful, but it's got a lot of stuff we don't actually need on it, so eventually we'll, we want to make our own PCB board that fits what we need. This again goes into our need to cut costs. We want to make this low cost so those floors can actually use it to we'll buy it. Also in the beta phase, we're going to add a cellular connectivity so that we can communicate between the device and our server without having to wire it up. And then finally our release, we'll combine all of these together and it'll be our final product for electronics. The next subsystem we'll talk about is our software, which is broken into four subsystems. From left to right is data collection, user interface, database, and Google API compatibility. Data collection will consist of data stored on a memory card. As mentioned before, uh, you're not always going to have cellular connectivity. Some schools are going to have worse service than others. And so we want to be able to store the data on there until we have cellular connectivity on the device, and then it'll send out the data. In addition to that, this also covers, as mentioned before, the need to get the software team up and running. We're going to have a USB connected in the early phases to our database. The next portion is send data to the server, which will consist primarily of using the cellular chip, as mentioned before. The next subsystem we'll talk about is our user interface, which will focus on intuitive design. This is going to middle schoolers, so we want to make sure, as I mentioned before, that it's easy to understand that, so that they can actually get an interest in the STEM field, otherwise they might get scared off. Uh, the database subsystem is broken into upload data to the server, 
via the cellular chip and store data in a convenient format. We can have all the data on our databases we want, but if the student can't understand it, they're just they're not going to care about it. It needs to be a, a nice map that they can read easily and it's not too intrusive for them to figure out what's going on. And the final portion of software is our Google API compatibility, which will focus on uh, using Google API to create a dynamic heat map of the PM. The next subsystem we'll talk about is our systems integration, which will consist of database population, which is the communication between our hardware and our software, making sure that both of those work in tandem. Software testing, making sure that the software is operating as we intended to. And hardware testing, making sure the hardware is working as intended. The next subsystem to discuss is management, which is broken into three other subsystems. Our project balance, financial balance, and documentation. Project balance is broken into WES, which we are discussing now, and Gantt and Network Diagram, which we'll be discussing slides in the future. Financial balance focuses on budgeting. We want to make sure we stay in budget. We don't want to go over. And part ordering, we want to make sure that we have the parts we need when we need them. Otherwise, we're going to get behind. And then documentation is finally uh, has presentation, memo, and our PDR. Moving on to our Gantt chart, again, as mentioned before, we have it color coded. All of the blue is our project management portions. As you can see by the dashes, we are complete with everything but our CDR presentation, uh, which will be, um, we assume, around October 8th. Uh, we have two hardware portions in the works. We have our initial sensor readings. We have those about 75% done. We're just kind of kind of fine tuning those, making sure all of our sensors work, and then. Going into that, we have our electronics alpha. We have about 15% of that done. The next thing that we're going to be starting on our schedule is uh, our software alpha. We want to get, try to get that up and running, get data to our software team, and get them working around the 11th of this month. So here's our network diagram. You can see it starts at the top and then it moves down to the bottom in three distinct rails. So uh, luckily, our project doesn't actually require uh, a bunch of these systems can be done independently of each other. So on the far left, we have our software, and that's where we can do our software alpha, beta, crowdsourcing, uh, everything like that. Um, the middle section is our uh, project management rail, and that's going to be all of our pro uh, presentations, documentation. And the far right rail is hardware, so initial sensor readings, hardware, alpha, beta, and then final hardware. And then the final four boxes uh, are our hardware and software integration, and then our final prototype. So moving on to a broader impact of this device, we believe that it's really important, um, especially in today's age with pollution increasing, that uh, we take a first step forward into uh, developing a way that we can really measure pollution and understand it and make it common knowledge, especially starting at a really young age. So we think that this is a really important project, especially also to increase in, uh, interest in the STEM field in young people. For a technical merit of this project, this device is extremely unique. It's the only device um, out there right now. Well, it's not completed yet, but it will be the only device that can do this. No other device can wirelessly in real time transmit pollution data and uh, create a map doing so. Um, so this device is extremely unique and it is paving the way for a new step in uh, pollution monitoring. So in conclusion, this device will be able to collect pollution data wirelessly and upload it onto a server. On that server, uh, it will have crowdsourcing capabilities, so multiple devices can be sending data to it at one time. And then um, using that data, it will create a map that shows the location and the reading of the pollution um, depending on location. And it will show the, the sensor reading at each location on the map. Um, it will do all these things while remaining low cost. Um, this is a big one because uh, if it's not low cost, then it meets the purpose of the project. Everything out right now is extremely expensive and it's hard to um, really get a good number of devices to develop um, a good uh, database of information. So keeping it low cost is really essential. Um, again, we believe that this is the first step in creating a new system that can be used to uh, monitor pollution in a large amount of area that hasn't been done before. Thank you. More questions? So, the first question is, how are you sending the location to your server using GPS? Uh, and then, the second one is, um, how many of these are you going to build? Like, is your, is your capstone just to build one and show that it functions? Um, so, we um, are for sure going to build one, but um, we're going to make one first, and then ideally we can make a couple of them, maybe three. 
to verify that the crowdsourcing works. Um, but I mean, we can't go building 10 to 20. We don't have manpower for that. But eventually down the road, that's um, what we want. It should be easy enough given our budget to make a couple because the first one's going to be more expensive. And then when we move on from that, we know what we're doing. It's, we know what device we're going to order. So uh, we're hoping to get around two or three so we can at least prove that they're capable of working together. So you all are talking about crowdsourcing it. And that's down the road. That's not for y'all to worry about so much. Um, but I, it's more of a comment I want y'all to think about while you're designing it. We are in Texas, so somebody is going to have their dads or their friends or their 5'9 Cummins with a cat or with a diesel exhaust delete, yeah. um, and they're going to roll coal on it. So just think about issues where people are going to be manipulating your data okay. <laughs> if, you, if, you crowd, if you open the crowdsource, that sort of data. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, okay, may, maybe I missed this, but like, what exact sensors are you using? What, like, how do the sensors work? Um, um, so we actually have prepared some data from sensors that we currently use. Um, on the right is the WaveShare one. This one, uh, we're probably not going to end up using it. We're probably going to end up using this one. It has, um, from what we've experienced, it's better. It actually tells you the size of the particles and how many there are. Um, so we think that this one's going to be better. So this. For PM, this is the only ones that we act. This, these are the only two that we actually have readings on as of now. Okay. Um, but we do. We're we're going to order tomorrow. We're actually meeting. We're going to order the GPS module, the cellular chip, all that stuff. And we're going to start working with that. But this is all we have for now. So um, I guess like I guess my question was like, did they work on like IR stuff? Or, like did they work based on infrared or did they work based on ultrasound? Because they can uh, give you issues with stability in the future. That, that's why I'm asking. You're asking the sensors. Yeah, yeah, the sensors itself. Like, do they work based on ultrasonic waves, or do they work based on like infrared waves? Because I believe it's infrared. I believe okay. So. Um, okay. Uh, I might want to look into more ultrasonic, just because ultrasonic uh, waves of like you know and stuff generally tend to be more stable. Okay. Overall, just okay. letting you know. That's, thank you. Uh, Could you go to your uh, timeline real quick? Your schedule overview. So, you guys are anticipating having your electronics alpha and electronics beta completed this semester. So our electronics alpha is going to consist of mainly breadboarding all these things together and getting our initial reading. And our electronics beta is to hopefully have a preliminary Altium design completed so that we can start going through that and debugging that and testing that. So will that include having your PCB fabricated and populated? We would like to be there, but... Given the fact that we've just gotten our LTM license, it's probably not a realistic one. So just from a kind of project scheduling standpoint, that is a very tight timeline to be on if you want to meet that. Learning Ultium is a steep learning curve, and if you really want to meet that April 30th deadline for your PCB, you are going to need to get on that very, very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Two things. First off, you guys are going to be pulling location data for a bunch of miners and storing it on a publicly accessible database. What are the laws in Texas? How are you going to protect the database? So that's not necessarily in our responsibility. That's more of our TTI, the Texas A&M Transportation